How can I know that the mission I think I have is my divine mission? It would be helpful if I knew the age of the person, but since the card's already written, already written without the age, you need to consider where you are, whether you're in junior high, senior high, in college, in prep school. The more educated you are and the more you've seen of the world, the more you've decreed and commune with God, you should be narrowing in what, what you do best and what is your greatest interest. In other words, what do you do that you love to do? I mean, that's where you find your mission. Because a mission is hard work, and if you're going to have a mission, you have to love it with all your heart. It's like if you get married. If you don't love your mate with all your heart, forget it, you know. These commitments in life are big. They're really big. So your mission is important. Think about it carefully. And maybe sometime you'll call me up and talk about it so I can hear a little bit more about you. I know drugs are bad for you, but isn't it just a normal curiosity to try it once or twice to see what it's like? Well, it's like um, partaking of forbidden fruit. You never know what drugs are going to do to you. You may think they do nothing. and. Again, here, I don't know which drugs you're talking about, but, you know, you can go from, from nicotine to heroin to anything you can name. And maybe you think it didn't hurt you at all, but maybe it did. The question is, if we have a certain amount of enlightenment, then why do we want to say, time out, El Maria? You know, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna go and f I'm gonna go and find out what the whole drug scene is all about and I'm gonna try it out and so forth. You know, it's your free will. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you not to do it. I'm certainly not gonna tell you to do it. But if I were you, I wouldn't do it. Because you don't know what you're gonna lose. You don't know if your brain is gonna com be compromised. I mean, marijuana, marijuana usage over prolonged periods creates a tremendous density in people. How many people here think it's a good idea to try out drugs? It isn't the majority. I saw two hands up. <laughs> so, you know, God gave you free will. I'm not sitting here to take away from you your free will. I'm going to talk to you the same way God talks to everybody. You have your freedom. You must make the right choices in life, and if you make the wrong choices, then you will have to deal with that. If you make the right choices, you're going to deal with that. And that's what life is all about. God gave you your freedom, your free will, to make your choices. Let's hope that they are enlightened. Let's hope that you think long and hard about major choices in your life. Why were Adam and Eve sent to be on the earth? What was their mission besides naming all the animals? <laughs> That's great. That's really great. Well, when Adam, Adam and Eve were in the garden, the garden was really a mystery school, and it was run by Lord Maitreya, and he was the great initiator. So uh, those who came to that university that was run by Lord Maitreya were not perfect souls. They had made karma and they were sent to the garden to be tested. So Maitreya is the great initiator and Adam and Eve were told they should not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because in the day that they would eat thereof they would surely die. So along comes a serpent and says to them, well, ye shall not surely die, whatever that means. Ye shall not surely die. You either die or you don't die, right? <laughs> There's no surely about it. So anyway, they bit the bait. The serpent, of course, is not a snake. He's a fallen angel. And he beguiles Eve and so forth. 
but there were many, many other twin flames also at that mystery school. Some of them passed their tests and some of them did not pass their tests. And so those who did not pass their tests uh, were sent out of this university, Maitreya's university. And so they went out into the world and they were no longer considered initiates on the spiritual path, but now they had to toil and work by the, swe the sweat of their brow. So, I don't know if it's millions of people, but many, many people have gone before Maitreya, have gone through his mystery school, have failed, and have had to take a long, long cycle over thousands of years to come back to the place where they could again receive the initiations of Lord Maitreya. In Genesis, he is called the Lord God, walked in the garden in the coolness of the morning and said, Adam, where art, where art thou? And Adam hesitates because he said, he says that um, they are now naked. They now know that they are naked and they are wearing fig leaves. So their eyes have been opened to duality. They no longer see through the single-eyed vision of the all-seeing eye of God. They now see through two eyes, which is duality. Well, we, we, we don't know which is the way to go. It, that's the problem with two-eyed vision. That's why we want to get back to meditating our th on our third eye. This, this temptation, we're talking about a couple of people who want to take drugs. Thou shalt not surely die. Yes, you can take drugs. You may or you may not die. It's like the same parallel. Are we going to start all over again after thousands of years of, of going through this and finally coming to the place of our victory and experiment with these drugs? How do we know that the serpent didn't give them drugs? You know, this is Atlantis. This is Lemuria. They, these are teeming civilization. They have spacecraft we've never seen before. They are far advanced beyond what we have in technology today. So when we look back in biblical times, these people weren't stupid. These people were the great lights of history. And then among them were the fallen angels. So Adam and Eve and Lord Maitreya and the whole mystery school was to try to bring back from all over the world those who had gone astray from God because they followed the wrong teachers. The teachers that look glamorous, are fantastic, are beautiful, are this, are that, but they're the fallen ones. So that's one of the reasons why Adam and Eve came to earth, besides naming the animals. <laughs> How can I know the amount of karma I have to balance? God keeps us guessing. <laughs> he doesn't tell us. So, we're reaching for 51%, which is a great dispensation. But since we don't know when we're going to get there, we have to be very, very good and keep on doing good works to be sure that the needle of our inner clock doesn't fall back to 50 and 49 and 48 and pretty soon you're not going to make your ascension if you don't make sure you've got more karma balanced than you need to make your ascension. Like work for the 51 percent and go for 52 and keep on going. You know, don't, don't slacken just because you think, well, you know, now I've made my 51 percent and uh, I'll be just fine thereafter. You ought to try making 100% and trying to keep it there. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to be absolutely perfect. And that's best basically what you'd have to be if you, if you had balanced 100% of your karma. And, and if you've done that, it would be a good time to make your ascension. But if you want to stick around on the planet a long time, you're probably your percentages will go down because, because we're human, uh, we do things that maybe aren't the exact thing that we ought to be doing. Maybe we, maybe we do something in a gray area that we don't even realize it. Why do Kuthumi and El Moria look so much alike? <laughs> you think they look alike because they both have beards and long hair? <laughs> How many think they look alike? Well, they, those portraits were taken in 1898. That was the style of the day. Kathumi is wearing a hat, a very nice fur hat. 
He's got a very nice tunic on. And uh, El Moria has his turban. And I think they look very different. <laughs> I think when you get to know people more, you know, they, they look different. Mother, could you please explain again the conserving of the sacred fire of the Kundalini? Naturally, when you are born, the sacred fire is rising on the altar of the spine. It has this beautiful ascending and descending pattern. And your whole body is nourished by that light. The organs are nourished. And, you know, you have unlimited energy. You learn to crawl. You learn to creep. You learn to walk. And you go nonstop. Because this sacred fire is in you. You are endowed with it. And depending on your past lives, you may have a tremendous amount of light or lesser light. So naturally in the body, the kundalini rises. But that doesn't mean to say all the sacred fire below the heart chakra uh, goes to the heart chakra and above. Uh, it is, there is a, necess a necessity for the balancing of the organs of the body so that the sacred fire reaches all of those organs on a regular basis. That's why exercise is important, yoga, meditation, right food. Everything we do to allow the light to flow in our body will extend our lives, stimulate our minds, give us greater intelligence, and so forth. So this raising and this up and down of the kundalini is just the natural play of life in the form. We have omega at the base, alpha at the crown. So when you are focused, let's say, in your studies, your energy is centered, or ought to be centered, in the crown chakra, the third eye. That is where you are contacting the mind of God, the source of intelligence in the universe. Um, and if you are very spiritually inclined and have momentums of spirituality from past lives, you also may see the masters, you may have a sense of their presence if you don't see them, and you feel a very high communion with God and nature. The throat chakra, there we sustain the sacred fire for its use as, as the power of the spoken word, because the worlds were framed by the word. So we call our sacred fire to the place where we need it. So we've talked about the stimulation of the crown chakra. You can do this through mant mantras to the five beyond Dhyani Buddhas. And so you'll feel, if you continue to focus on that point of the crown, you start feeling a tingling, you feel an activation of the brain, you feel a greater stimulus of the mind of God. The third eye is not only for um, learning and thinking, but it is also for seeing. And within the third eye is that capacity to understand and use the, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The throat chakra, as we've said, is the empowerment, and the heart is the central sun of our being with its 12 petals. Then to the left of the heart, we have the secret chamber of the heart where your threefold flame is sealed. Now our energies may move swiftly to the solar plexus in a case of fear, being threatened, um, some calamity is happening, and all of a sudden you don't even realize it, but your energy, energies have rushed to that place of the sun, that place of, it's the body of desire and the body of emotions. So that's where your kundalini may rest because that is the burden that is upon your body. Let's say you're in meditation, or let's say you're listening to music that is uh, conducive to entering higher planes of consciousness. You would be communing through your soul. Your seat of the soul chakra is beneath the level of conscious awareness. So what you learn through your soul comes from the subconscious mind. And very often the soul will say to you and give you a warning. You know, don't go here because there is, there is danger here. How many of you have known that self-protective sense that 
somehow you feel you're in danger. Isn't it wonderful that God gives us this? We have this, this right inside of ourselves. There's suddenly that sense, you know, something not right is happening. So that's the seat of the soul chakra. And when you acquaint yourself with that soul, it's like having a sixth sense. And that's what you get from the seat of the soul. We have four petals in the base of the spine chakra. Now when that sacred fire is consecrated to life, it, as I said, it is pulsating and it, and it is rising. It does not remain there, but there is always a flow that is rising, even if it's small. So in the procreative process, if we have garnered our light, if we haven't squandered it in various ways, then when we procreate, we endow our offspring with a tremendous light that we have disciplined ourselves to have in our bodies and that light goes into our offspring. People who misuse that light, who squander it, who spend it, then when they are ready to have children, they have not conserved the light to endow them with the light that they need to go out and conquer the world. We do not do as some organizations do, which is to have a male and a female face one another, meditate into each other's eyes. This is, this is a practice of false teachers, and we do not do that. You should meditate in a quiet place, alone, and not overdo it. You can sit with your legs crossed and meditate and feel the rising of that energy. You can feel it pulsating at the base of the brain. You can feel it pulsating here. But there is a process of getting it there. Yoga is one of them. Meditation is another. So the sacred fire is the gift of life. It is our life. We're given a quotient of it depending on how we used our light in past lives. So we come with that quotient of light. We can squander it. We can spend it and have nothing. And old, old age comes very early to people who do that. Or we can conserve it and we can worship the Divine Mother who gives us this light in our bodies. Take care of it because you don't get it back if you squander it. What can the teens do for the world, directly or indirectly? I think the most important thing you can do is decide on your profession, get the best possible education, come, get to the top of your field, whatever it is, and make your contribution in that field, whether you're going to be a doctor or whatever it's going to be. Now is the time to get the education that is the very best and to be the very best in your community, in your group, in your generation. So don't compromise that. Go for the top. Win. You know, be on top because you will be leaders on the spiritual path, but people will not first recognize you for your spiritual path. They will recognize and acclaim you because you're accomplished in your field, and they will respect you. They will respect what you know. They will come to you for advice. And then you will find gradually that the spiritual people will come to you because they see the light in your eyes. They see that you are different. And so to those people you can begin to tell them a little bit about the path that you are on. And so that is a very important point. If you don't have credentials anywhere, then who's going to believe you that you know any more about religion than they do? So this is your time for mastery. Get your advanced degrees. After one ascends, does he or she always take on the appearance of their last embodiment? I think, I think it's the other way around. I think that in the final embodiment of our lives, when we make our ascension, we take on the likeness of who we were in the beginning before we had committed any karma. It's the only time that we're really going to see ourselves as we were when we were perfect when God first made us. 
Then we come along and we get into different cultures, uh, different types of people with different types of genes and so forth. And so we start looking like the people that we were born through and so forth. I don't think any of us really knows how we looked in the absolute beginning. All we have to go by is what we see in the mirror. And that's backwards anyway. <laughs> I know but I don't know how to act. Can you tell me how to be? <laughs> I can tell you a lot of how to, about how to be. I think the first thing that you must practice is grace. Grace is a quality of the Holy Spirit. Be gracious to people, whether they're older or younger than you. Help older people. Talk with older people. Try to identify with their generation. Stop and, and just be gracious to people who, who are around you. If someone is near you, say something nice to them, even if you don't know them. You can always find something nice about anyone. You just need to look. And that is the beginning of a relationship. You open your heart through grace. It's like the song we sing, Amazing Grace. Grace is something absolutely wonderful. And when you are gracious, people will be gracious to you in return. And we will return to civility in our country. We won't talk to each other harshly. We won't have those put downs. We won't ignore people. We won't make fun of them. And, and all of these things that, that hurt us deeply. So that's one part of knowing how to be. If you're always gracious, always kind and supportive and loving, that is, that is the beginning of all manners, all etiquette, anything you can think of beyond that. There are basic rules of interaction, not interrupting people, not gossiping. There, there are all kinds of things like that that we know that we have to deal with. But if you put forward an open, compassionate heart and extend grace, people will love you, you will love them, you will have many friends, you will not say unkind words. You will always find something very special about someone that you can say. I admire you for this. But always be truthful. Never pretend. Never pretend. Always be honest. And you will find that you will learn how to interact with people all over the world. When I was 19, I worked at the United Nations and I worked for the delegate's private photographer. So I had to meet all the delegates from around the world and present to them the proofs of their photographs so they could send them home and have them published in their newspapers and so forth. And so I learned to move among some of the most powerful people in the world at the United Nations, because I did this all day long for three months during a, a college co-op program. And I found that People are the same all over the world. They're just people. We don't have to look at, up at them as the high and the mighty. We don't have to bow and scrape. We don't have to condemn them. People are just plain people. And if you are gracious toward them, they will be gracious toward you. So it doesn't matter where you go. It is grace that will always be the answer. What shall I do now? What shall I say? You know, what shall I not say? That's the beginning. The rest of it you can learn from very good books. But if you don't have love and grace, all the rest of it is kind of dry. Regarding relationships with the opposite sex, how does one tell the difference between infatuation and true love? If you don't know, then let time tell you. Don't jump into something if you don't know. Don't be so anxious to have you know, a, a great romantic involvement and then be hurt, be profoundly hurt afterwards because 
you didn't wait and watch and take things step by step and know what you're getting into from the beginning and so forth. This is a question regarding masturbation, what it does to you, the karma it makes, how to stop, what decrees, what it is that's happening to you. This, in, this involves the raising of the sacred fire. I think we know that masturbation can become addictive. We can get addicted to masturbating, which is a very sad situation. Because what it does, it allows you to squander your light and allow uh, the entities to steal that light from you. I think the biggest problem that, that it does is that it's an addiction and you waste your light. So if you're going to break the habit, I would suggest that you get off red meat, you get off the sugars, you can do yoga, you can do exercise, you can do running, whatever athletic type of thing you want, you like to do. But stay away from the dairy, the red meat, and too much sugar. What you eat has a large a play in how you deal with a sacred fire and how you become the master of it. I'll give you an example. I will have been talking 12 days by the time I'm through here. And I do not touch dairy, except once in a while I have eggs, but I never eat any cheese, milk, dairy products. Because I do not do that, my voice continues to work for me. If I would begin eating those foods, I would have lost my voice already. I couldn't conduct this conference. So life has trade-offs. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Life has trade-offs. If I want to deliver the teachings of the masters at this conference, I have to give up something. And so I give it up because it's more important. So if you want to attain your ascension, weave your deathless solar body, you need all that sacred fire. You can't squander it. So what do you do? Maybe you have to jump in a cold shower. Maybe you have to go out running at night. Whatever you have to do, you know, it's your body and you are the rider and it's the horse. Now you cannot let that body dominate you. You cannot let it. I can't let my body dominate me. I have things to do, I have to do them. Forget it, you know. Don't tell me I can't do it. I'm doing this. And your body, you have to ride it. You're not going to wear this body when you go to heaven. And you can overcome this. This is one of these things that has just gone along in our culture and it has multiplied and multiplied and multiplied and doctors say it's good for you and why not and all this and all that. But remember, you are becoming saints. You are ascending to God. You can't expect to go to heaven with all your baggage. You've you got to start getting rid of it. You can conquer this. There is no question about it. You can conquer this. You can raise your kundalini and you can get back to that place where this is not going to be a burden to you. So, I challenge you to take dominion over yourself. I challenge you to do it. You can do it. Now let's get going and do it. Go ahead, run till you're exhausted and just have your good sleep and get up and be in command. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 1-800-323-5228. That's 1-800-323-5228. What happens when the Holy Spirit enters your being? 
Does the Holy Spirit cause people to convulse on the floor as, as often occurs in a Pentecostal movement? No. The Holy Spirit does not cause people to roll on the floor as the Pentecostals do. And I want to tell you that I have compassion for the Pentecostals because they think they are receiving the Holy Spirit. But they are not because they do not have the protection. So people think that if they sing and call for the Holy Spirit and raise their hands and maybe they say uh, the, the, the Lord's Prayer and, and other things, but they have not established their protection. And you have to have a circle of protection when you are calling upon the Holy Spirit. I remember that when I was teaching about the Christian religion that I took my students to a church in Colorado where we, we were having our SU there at that time. And I took them to a church so that they could see the church in that town where they did exactly this. Uh, they prayed and they received the Holy Spirit. So the pastor invited us to make a circle and before I knew it, this man had his palm on my third eye and the pain that went through me was like an absolute knife. It took me at least a week to get rid of this energy which was not of God but of the demons. I mean, through the hand of this person was transmitted de demons to me, and it's like I almost fell on the floor. And I could not get rid of that pain, night or day. And so I did my decrees, and did my decrees, and did my decrees. So I know firsthand, and I see it on television, and of course there's a lot of charlatans on, tele on television, and there's a lot of good and holy people in this world also. And I don't minimize that. But we who know better have to call upon the Holy Spirit, do our protection, and we receive the Holy Spirit gradually, not suddenly. So gradually, little by little, we are assimilating the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a fire, white fire of God. It is the pink flame of divine love. It is the wisdom and enlightenment of God. And step by step, little by little, the Maha Chohan, the representative of the Holy Spirit, will give you in increments as much of the Holy Spirit that you can handle, as you can handle, and still be balanced and normal and carry on your life. And so we all want that Holy Spirit in our temples, and God will give it to us when we have that right balance. I'll tell you one thing, when the demons steal your light from masturbation, that light does not accrue to your chakras and your four lower bodies as a cumulative energy that you are gathering with the Machohan and through him. So that's what it does. It prevents you from having that full light that belongs to you. That light is being stolen. The light is being stolen when you masturbate. How can we know the will of God for our, our life? Please help with suggestions to ease the struggle and surrender. I think that to answer this question, I should ask you to close your eyes, to put the palm of your hand as though you were blessing your third eye like this. Now go in your energy to your third eye and ask yourself, what is the one thing in this world that is more important to me than anything else, than anything else at all? Now just meditate on that. Does something definite come into your mind? Some of you will probably say yes and some may say no. I'm asking you to do this because when God called me to be a messenger and Mark Prophet and El Moria took me on as their chila, El Moria said and Mark said that Mark would not be an embodiment for very long perhaps the most three years. 
that I needed to be trained to be a messenger because it's much more difficult to train a messenger when an ascended master trains an unascended being than when someone who is a messenger who's an embodiment trains you. So El Moria trained me through Mark Prophet. Now when I realized in what poor health Mark was, it became the all-consuming goal of my life to pass my tests so that the Darjeeling Council would have a messenger if and when Mark Prophet left this world. As it was, I changed his diet for him and he lived 12 years when he was expected to only live three, which gave us the opportunity to have four children, which we never would have had. So that was a great blessing. Al Mori also showed me that, showed me the future, the world, where the world was going, and how it's very possible that great darkness could cover the world before light, great light would come again toward the end of this century and beyond. And so I pondered this because Al Moria said there wasn't anyone else available to take this training. And I had had this training when I was Catherine of Siena. God dictated to me his dialogues, which you can read in the book, The Dialogues of Catherine of Siena. And also as an oracle of Delphi under Pallas Athena and in similar roles on Atlantis, I have been an instrument. And so I had a lot of momentum on being a messenger who just didn't start in this life. So El Moria gave me this panorama of what could happen in this world. And I knew, as they had told me, that there just wasn't anyone else that could be trained in so short a time. So at that moment, it was like me putting my hand on my forehead, as I, as I just asked you to do, and, and and focusing on what is the one most important thing I can do in this life to help mankind and help the world? Well, the answer was right before me. I had just been told, you know, there is no one else for this job. You are it or we will not have a messenger until one comes along decades from now. So it was the all-consuming joy of my life to do this, and it still is, because we must have the light coming through the mouth of the masters. The masters bring down stupendous light. They pour it not only through me, but through you. And when you get that light, you are being raised. You are moving toward your ascension. That light at every conference you come to is a gift. So who could make any other choice? So if you have a choice to make, Think of your, your answer, how many people can I affect for good by, by becoming this or that in that prof profession? I mean, what is the best thing I can do to reach the most people in this world to give them this light and help them make their ascension? So if you think that way, that's the way I think. If God needs somebody to do a job for him, and I look around this way, and I look around that way, and I, I see that there's nobody there, then I just do the job. That's how I figure out what I'm supposed to do. That's it. Please explain the difference between receiving the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, or any thereof, and receiving the Christ consciousness at 33. What does it mean to be Christed? Thank you. It's the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit and we earn them step by step as we move with the Holy Spirit. As we see the Maha Chohan as a person and we recognize him as our teacher and we call upon him to enlighten us. And that is the step by step process I explained to you as opposed to the Pentecostal method. So receiving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the comforter that Jesus said he would send. 
and that the, the Holy Spirit would teach us all things, would bring to our remembrance everything that Jesus had taught us. The Christ conscious, receiving the Christ consciousness at 33, it is a goal, but don't feel bad if you have not fully internalized your Holy Christ self, which would mean you would be walking the earth as a Christ. Christ, well, the term Christed one is a, is a term that we use for the anointed one, one who is anointed of the light of the Christ, and Christos in Greek means light. So every day you put on the Christ consciousness and you bind the carnal mind and the dweller on the threshold with the help of Archangel Michael. We look for that anointing and we will receive it in due course. God gives it to us when we have earned it. If we haven't earned it, he keeps us going, gives us tasks and assignments until we finally are capable of receiving the Christ consciousness or the gifts of the Holy Spirit and we will not compromise them. We will not lose them. We have to prove our trust in God. I read in one of the pearls that I could ask El Moria through you if I should be living at the Royal Teton Ranch giving service to God. Well, should I? <laughs> you should go to your heart of hearts and say, is this what I really want to do? Is this my deep inner longing to serve at the Royal Teton Ranch, to serve El Moria, to be his chile here? Ask yourself the question, try on the shoes. Try on the shoes, see how they fit. You have to determine if this is your place. You have free will, remember. We have free will. I am not gonna tell you whether or not you should be here, but if you are in perpetual uh, not knowing which way to go. What we do is we take the nearest step that is right. Okay, what's, what's the best thing I can do today, tomorrow, in the next six months? If you can't think of anything else better to do, yes, then come and work at the Royal Teton Ranch for six months until you figure it out. But what you must never do on the path is to do nothing. Because if you do nothing, then you're not experimenting. You're not trying on somebody else's shoes. So you really don't know whether you'd like to do this, that, or the next thing. So you get, have to get out and start doing something. If you don't like it, then you found out that you didn't like it, you know. I think it's the greatest place in the world to be because you get chileship and you get to publish the teachings to all kinds of people who until they receive them, don't know where they're going and what they're doing. How do you know when or if you have found your twin flame? <clears throat> I came to the, the um, conclusion many years ago that I should not tell people who their twin flames are. Why? Because if they didn't recognize each other, then why should I be telling them that they're twin flames? It didn't make any sense, right? If you don't even know your twin flame when you find your twin flame, don't you think you should know your twin flame when you find them? You have to have somebody else to tell you, oh, this is your twin flame. You know, how do you do? I'd like to introduce you. <laughs> so I said, no more of this. I'm not going to tell people who's their twin flame. So if you want to call to El Moria or the Ma Chohan to bring you to your twin flame, you can write a letter to the masters, you can write a letter to Linello, you can write it every night and burn it until you have your answer. And the answer may not be a direct voice from Linello, but all of a sudden, deep within your being, you are sensing that you're nearer to your twin flame than you thought you were. And you may have a calm peace about that one. He, may be, uh, he or she may be an ascended master. But I think it's a very private thing to seek and find your twin flame. The best way to identify your twin flame is really to identify yourself in God. 
And when you mirror God, that, that mirror of God will also mirror back to you your twin flame. If we have a lot of karmic baggage, we might be far apart from our twin flame. So we get rid of the baggage of our psychology and then we realize that yes, so and so is our twin flame. Why is so difficult or hard to some people relate or have a social relation with the other? What I, what I make of the question is that if you can't relate to people, if that is the question, you always begin with grace and love. We're all human beings, we all have certain things in common. If you can find one or something in common, one thing or something in common with people, that begins making a relationship easier. Giving of oneself is always a successful way to have good relationships. Don't expect anything. You do all the giving. That's how to succeed in life. Don't expect to receive. Only expect that you are going to give and give and give and give. This card says, I've had three years of therapy, yet I still have not been able to resolve the pain of having ended a relationship. If therapy doesn't work, what can I do? I hate to keep getting back to this, but it is absolutely true that the way you think and how your emotions are have a lot to do about what you're eating. You can be in a perpetual state of depression because you are perpetually eating sweets, for instance. So if you don't look back to your body, you're not going to understand why you're not getting through therapy. Therapy is wonderful, but ultimately the cure is the violet flame. We may come to an understanding of our problems in therapy. We may see what the cause was and why it is happening, but we really never get through it unless we have the violet flame of the Holy Spirit and that flame transmutes the cause, effect, record, and memory of the problem. So a lot of therapy is good, but a lot of therapy just where people don't apply, Jesus Christ or the masters. When they get to the end of this life, they're still going to have the records of it. The records are still there, even if they have come to a resolution and understanding of it, they still may not have balanced the karma with the person. But therapy is excellent when you have a therapist who is also in the teachings. You know, there's nothing like being determined if you don't like the way you're operating or you're feeling. You can look in the mirror, you can say, I just don't like myself and I'm going to change. And I'm going to change starting today. You know, you can recreate yourself. You don't have to wait for someone to come along. Is that wind or rain? Boy, it really came along, didn't it? You see what I mean? I mean, our parents brought us into the world, but we don't have to fashion ourselves after them. We are plastic. We can change from one day to the next. We can decide the person who we want to be. Isn't that exciting? We can recreate ourselves today and tomorrow. We're not stuck. That's what we can do. So let's get on and do it. See, let's just get on with it and do it. If my parents on their deathbed ask me to renounce the masters, what should I do? To thine own self be true. Your parents have lived their lives. They cannot haunt you thereafter because you had to promise to them that you would renounce the masters. A parent cannot inflict this upon their child. You have free will to follow the path. 
If you can say something to them like, I will always confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord, and that makes them happy, and it's also true, and that's fine, but, but you can't make a promise like that when you know that you, you will not fulfill it. And especially at the deathbed, one must be truthful. I mean, parents are wonderful, but you can't let them control you from the grave. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, you're your own person. What decrees have the Ascended Masters asked us to do on a regular basis? That's a very good question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. I would say the most important thing you can do when you get up in the morning and you are ready to go to your altar and pray is to give the Violet Fire and Tube of Light Decree three times with real energy, real intensity. You know, just, don't just mouth it, but call down the fire of heaven when you give that Tube of Light because it'll save you a whole lot of trouble, nonsense, stuff goes wrong, you know, the car doesn't work, you know, all this kind of animal magnetism that comes along through discarnates and demons. The next thing is Archangel Michael. Don't ever forget him. Call to him. If you have to go somewhere, you know, if you're traveling, right after the three tubes of light is Archangel Michael. That takes care of your protection. The Heart, Head and Hand Decree is a magnificent decree because it takes you through the steps of the chakras and I've noted those chakras in the Angels Booklet as well as in our own decree book. The Violet Flame is important. The earlier you do it, the better because you're transmuting the karma of the day. I think most of you know that your angel comes at dawn and deposits on your doorstep the karma of the day. You all know that, right? No? Yes. Okay, well, we know it now, right? Okay, so every morning, the karma of, of that is going, you're going to deal with that day is sitting on your doorstep. So that's at dawn, and so in the summer, it could be um, much earlier than later, but 5 o'clock is a good time to get, get through with that karma of the day. God gives us a little bit of karma each day so that by the time we reach the end of our lives, we have balanced it systematically. So we pick up that satchel of karma and we do 15 minutes of violet flame. But this is intense. This is the fiat type stuff. You're standing up, you're charging, you're calling to God. You know, it's not passive. Don't ever be passive with God. God doesn't like lukewarm people. You know, you really have to be a charger and then God has respect for you. Did you know that? It says that in the Bible a few places that God had respect uh, for some of the great the great people of the Bible. So the Violet Flame Decree, 15 minutes. You know, we, we've been given the dispensation that it's multiplied, so it counts for more than 15 minutes. And when you feel kind of you've reached um, an equilibrium, you kind of have the sense that in that Violet Flame session you have covered the day. Or you have a sense that even if you're not an astrologer, things look pretty bleak today, I better give a little extra violet flame because I think I'm going to encounter a lot of challenges. It just feels like that kind of a day, you know? You know how it is when you get up in the morning, you're going to charge, and then everything comes between you and what you were going to do that day. This is how you get rid of it early, and you just slice right through, just like the sword, you know? Just go right through your day. At the end of it, you've done everything, a checklist, you know, it's all done. And then at night, you make your calls to go to the retreats. Don't ever fail to do that because an archangel is waiting to take you. Angels come along and you are going to learn a lot in the retreats. You go out with Archangel Michael. You see how the, the angels um, wage war against the fallen angels. One of the reasons that I watch the news the last thing at night is so that I can get in bed, go to sleep, and go out and help the angels deal with what I've just seen on the news or in the newspapers. It's, it's really good to keep on top of things that way. You feel like you're really part of the action when you know what's happening and you know what you can do about it. So I think that is going to conclude our session for this evening. It's been wonderful being with you.
have been watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet. This program is presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047 5000. For free information on personal growth and spirituality, call 1-800-323-5228.